Welcome into Ride the Line, the greatest podcast in sports betting entertainment. My name is Tanner Kern, certified G, bona fide stud, and you can't teach that. In this right here, this is G Money Grant Mitchell. He has a future bet on an NBA exact matchup that's not going to hit because he doesn't respect the Boston Celtics. You can't teach that. Bada boom. Man of the people in the room, welcome into Ride the Line, Grant. I will happily take my Nuggets Bucks NBA Finals future pick, Tanner. Thank you very much. Let me see Jason Tatum take down Giannis and Dame head to head, and then I will respect the Celtics. He's already done Giannis. He'll take down Dame anytime. Anyways, we're not talking about NBA today. We will next week, though. We're probably going to start doing some live shows just to let you guys know. We're going to talk about the day of sports at hand. We can talk about the football game that day or uh, the day after. We'll also talk about Maction. We had a snow Maction game last night. We got a lot of fun stuff happening in the sports world. So we're going to not only do football, we're going to do everything uh, starting on Monday. So make sure you subscribe and look into that. Another thing, Grant... Josh McDaniels doesn't have a job anymore. Neither does the GM for the Las Vegas Raiders. You said it was well-deserved. I agree with you. Why do you think it's well-deserved? I think it's well-deserved because Josh McDaniels has one of the worst coaching records of any coach in the history of the NFL. And that's not my opinion. You can go look it up. His win percentage is extremely low. The Raiders just make a series of puzzling decisions. First, they bring in a guy in John Gruden who's been out of coaching for a decade. Then they replace him with somebody who willingly tied himself to Tim Tebow in Denver and now willingly ties himself to Jimmy Garoppolo in Vegas. It was just a mess to begin with. The players aren't happy. The star players, Max Crosby and Devontae Adams, are saying it shouldn't be like this. You know, they're they're t- flirting with the idea of not wanting to be there. I also think the Raiders probably could have dealt Devontae at the trade deadline. Now, I'm not saying that McDaniels himself is responsible for that not happening, but him and the general manager, I feel like at least had some sort of input on it. And if you're the Raiders, you could have gotten a pretty good haul there because a Super Bowl contending team would have given you a lot for a guy in Devontae Adams who's a top three wide receiver in the league. So I think it was about time. This team was clearly going nowhere. You need to blow up the head coach. You need to blow up the quarterback. You need to blow up a lot of that defense and start over. I like the move to not trade Devontae Adams now that they fired Sean uh, McDaniels I like the move a lot more because everyone's like trade Devontae Adams at the deadline get rid of everyone but nobody was talking about McDaniels getting fired either so now you fire the GM you fire the coach the talent's there you give me a good quarterback the talent's there you can make some plays and you know what with Jimmy G I don't think he's as bad as we've seen like I don't think they're scheming him the right way I don't think they're scheming Devontae Adams because if you if you go off the logic that uh Jimmy Garoppolo is a bad quarterback. I'm not saying he's a good quarterback, but if you go off the logic, like you could say Devontae Adams is a bad wide receiver because he's not getting the football either. Like they're not even finding ways to get him the football. Um, so I think with a new coach, I think it's the right move not to trade Devontae Adams. See what you can do possibly next season. Then you can get rid of him next year if nothing goes your way. I, I disagree with that assessment. A receiver is a dependent position. He is dependent on the quarterback to give him the football. So maybe they're not scheming for him properly. And, and maybe they're not maximizing Garoppolo's strengths. But Garoppolo's strengths are still very limited. I don't think there's a world in which you can make a case he's a top half quarterback, no matter who the coach is. So uh, going back to keeping Devontae, though, I, I guess you want to you know have some sort of outlook for the next couple of seasons. And I get that. But I don't know. I just don't see this team going anywhere anytime soon. And if that's the case, you don't need to be spending all that money on a wide receiver. No, but they also, I don't think anyone wanted to take the cap either. Like well, that's it's a lot structured a little bit strangely. I think, I think he's only making like $2 million the rest of the year. And then it goes to like 17 next year. And then it's 70 the next two seasons over that. So it's very much backloaded. Yeah. So some team would have to take that on and they probably just don't want to do that. Um, the 49ers make a splash going after Chase Young. Your whole commander's defensive line is not existed anymore. Uh, I wouldn't say that. Deron Payne and Jonathan Allen are very good defensive tackles. And honestly, I don't mind the decision from the commanders, but I also love it from a 49ers perspective because you get Chase Young for a third round pick after Montez Sweat goes for a second. Honestly, I think uh, I think Montez Sweat was tremendously underappreciated and undervalued by a majority of the commanders fans. He had a better tenure with the commanders than Chase Young did. So I think the compensation does make sense, but it's still a good move for the 49ers because you paid all that money to Nick Bosa in the offseason. He hasn't really delivered on that statistically speaking. 
thing. He, he has impact on the game. Opposing offensive coordinators have to double team him. They have to scheme for him. But he's only gotten to the quarterback a couple of times. You get Chase Young. This is a buy low, sell high sort of move where if you get him humming and you keep his injury problems out of the way, then he can become that guy that we saw who was drafted second overall. And then also his presence there just means you're allowed to rest Bosa or whoever else on the sidelines more often. So when they come in the game, they're fresher and they are able to have a greater impact. So I like the move a lot for the 49ers. I like the move for the 49ers because they can afford to give up the draft pick. They don't have control of him next season. So that's a good move for the commanders too. I don't like the move from the Bears though. I, oh I, no, it makes no sense because you give up the, the reason that it's it's also partially good for the Niners is both Sweat and Young are free agents in the summer. But the 49ers giving up a third round draft pick is basically them giving up a fourth round draft pick because they're gonna have such a good record. It's gonna come at the end of the round. The Bears are gonna be competing for the number one pick in the draft, which means that second round pick basically going to be like a very late first round pick so you can still get a really quality player with that and to your point Montez Sweat is only going to be there for the next nine games as a guarantee you could lose them in the summer this is a team that is rebuilding has basically no hope of making the playoffs this this move just makes no sense and on top of that the defense has been improving over the last three or four weeks they've gone from giving up 30 plus points per game to 20 over the last month so yes it is a nice move in the sense that Montez Sweat is a very good player, but you're not guaranteed to have him for more than a couple of months, and you gave up a very important asset in your rebuilding process. So it was a very bad decision from the Bears in that regard. They did double their sack total with them on the defensive line, so it was six and a half for him. The Bears' defensive line has six and a half this season. So they, they got better. It just wasn't the smart move for the future. But trade deadline, Josh Dobbs went to the Vikings. I don't think anyone really cares about that. I was hoping Jameis got dealt. You've been a big Jameis supporter for a while now. He's that guy. You telling me the Raiders wouldn't be better if they had Jameis Winston playing quarterback? Absolutely, they would be. They'd be a lot better. Jameis is a good quarterback. Jameis is good enough to be a starting quarterback in the NFL, but he's a really good backup. He's a really good backup. Yeah, 100. Jameis, Jameis is definitely a starting caliber quarterback in the NFL. I don't disagree with you at all. But I think the Patriots would be better with Jameis Winston, too. I think they you should. You don't want to see your Mac. guy, uh, Mac Jones? Mac attack? No. Give me, give me, give me someone out. I, you know what? I'll take Jimmy G over Mac Jones. I think honestly, they're both pretty bad. Uh, I think it's apples to oranges at that point. I think they're very, very similar players. You know what's crazy though? Looking at stats for this Titans Steelers game, this is how bad the Steelers defense actually is. Jimmy okay. G threw for three hundred and twenty-four yards against the Pittsburgh Steelers. They're, they are the, so, the, they're the most defense. typical Ben don't break type of defense. That's what mm -hmm. they are. They give up a ton of yards and they turn the ball. They, they create turnovers, but they give up a ton of yards on the ground and through the air. So we got a big game, Grant. Titans, Steelers, Thursday night football. Will Levis, boy wonder, coming in after four touchdown pass performances debut. I don't think this game is going to go very well for the Tennessee Titans. I think they're going to rack up yards. I don't think they're going to win. You look at Will Levis. I read a thread. Shout out to Josh Larkey from the 33rd team. I was reading a thread on how Will Levis actually played uh, on Sunday. And he hit some big balls. It was big balls. <laughs> a, little, a little weird, a little weird phrase there. Hit some big balls. He had some big throws down the field. He made some plays. With that being said, though, his efficiency wasn't great. And I think we're going to see Mike Tomlin expose that on Thursday. Not saying he doesn't throw for 210 yards or whatever and go over his total. But I think we're going to see him get exposed a little bit. Yeah, I'm definitely on board with that. Obviously, it was a very, very good debut for Levis. I don't want to take that away, especially considering how terrible the Titans' offense has looked at times with Tannehill. But it's not as good as if you load up the box score and you see the 250-plus yards, the four touchdowns. It wasn't that good. And to your point, the Steelers, sure, they're going to give up a lot of yards because that's what they do. But they are game wreckers on that defensive line. They're going to be flying off of the edges. And this is Will Levis, who in his senior season at Kentucky still only completed 65% of his passes, 19 touchdowns, 10 interceptions. You know, decent numbers, but nothing amazing. Nothing to warrant him coming into the NFL and putting up four touchdowns and no interceptions in a dominating win every single week. You're getting a guy in Mike Tomlin who is excellent, um, you know, whether he's 
when he's at home, when he's an underdog. And not that that necessarily applies because the Steelers are favored in this game. But the jury is out on the Steelers right now. People don't really believe in them. Kenny Pickett is coming back from a rib injury. He's he's promised he will play. Whether he does or not remains to be seen. Um, but my pick does kind of rely on him playing because I don't want to see Mitchell Trubisky in there. But this is just a spot where the Steelers, the expectations are low. You get them. They find a way to win this game. You know, they can score 13 points. Their only touchdown comes from a, a fumble, a scoop and score, and they still end up winning. This is just going to be one of those types of games, I think. I feel exactly the same in this game if Mitch Trubisky plays over Kenny Pickett. There's no, there's really not much of a difference between those two quarterbacks. It's not, really? it's not like, I think, I mean, Trubisky was awful last week. He, he was 130 yards, a touchdown, and two interceptions, I think. Pickett's just as bad, though. Pickett's been just as bad this season. Yeah, he, yeah, he's been pretty bad. I didn't understand that. I I didn't understand the decision to draft him in the first round a couple of years ago. I think they need to move on as well. Um, but just going back to the main point here, the, the key to this game, uh, if you're a Steelers better, it's going to be that defensive line. Can they heat up Levis? Can they force him to speed up his progressions? Can they get him on the ground, force him into mistakes? The good news is the Titans have, according to Pro Football Focus, the third worst offensive line in the entire league. That's not going to hold up well against TJ Watt and Highsmith. And those boys. So I'm confident picking the Steelers here. Well, you got to look at it. Like Will Levis had the best debut possible. It's only going to go down from here. It's not going to go up. It's not going to be, he's not going to be better than 240 or 250 or 260, I think, total yards with run the football and four touchdowns. It's just not going to happen. He's not going to have multiple bombs, DeAndre Hopkins down the field. DeAndre Hopkins isn't going to have three touchdowns. If he does, they win the game. But I just don't see that happening. I think Pittsburgh finds a way to win this one. It's not going to be with offense. Their offense has been horrendous. They can't run the football with Najee Harris. They can't run it uh, with Jalen Warren. They just they can't do anything. They really struggle on offense. It's going to be with defense. It's going to have to force turnovers, and they're going to have to make Will Levis uncomfortable and put the offense in good situations, which I think they have a very good chance of doing that. Do you have a favorite player prop for this game? I do. I'm going to go, speaking of DeAndre Hopkins, I, I think Will Levis could throw for his total here, 204 and a half. I don't think we're going to see this low of a total moving forward, especially if they're just taking shots down the field to DeAndre Hopkins. The Steelers give up a ton of yards. The, it's 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 kind of crazy when you actually look at the box score. They give up 264 passing yards per game. They give up 137 rushing yards per game. I don't want to bet on Will Levis here necessarily for the low passing total. I think it's worth playing, but I'd rather go towards DeAndre Hopkins for a very low receiving total. He was very close to this consistently. He was going over this number as well at, at times with Ryan Tannehill at 54 and a half. And I think we give the Steelers a little too much credit. Yes, they're a bend but don't break defense. That results in yards, though. So DeAndre Hopkins going over 54 and a half yards. Him and Will Levis seem to have a very good connection down the field. And I think we're going to see him have a pretty big day here. He's He's gone over 100 yards, I think, two times in the past three weeks, I believe. Um, he's had a couple hundred yard game in his past five. He's gone over this total, I believe, three times in his past five. So I would I would lean on him for this total. To your point, the Steelers give up the third most yards per game in the entire league. So definitely supports that. I don't think that's a bad pick. Now, I do have a problem with one thing you said, which was the Steelers can't run the ball with Jalen Warren because I'm taking the over on Jalen Warren's rushing total in this game. That is my favorite bet here. Now, the Titans, when you think of them and their defense, you think horrible pass defense, amazing run defense. Well, that's not necessarily been the case. For the year, they are 16th, so just right in the middle of the league in rushing yards allowed per game at 107. However, over the last three weeks, that has spiked to 157, and they haven't necessarily been playing dominant run games. Okay, but they played the Ravens, but they, we know about the injury concerns they have. They played the Colts, a team that they could slow down, but they ultimately did not, and they just been getting gashed. And we know that Warren is very much the off-speed pitch to Najee Harris, who's Najee is sort of the Zeke Elliott. Warren is the Tony Pollard. He comes in. He's going to give you a 10 to 15 yard run here and there. And looking at what he's been able to do, he only had 19 yards last week. But prior to that, he had four straight outings where he went over his rushing total for tonight's game or for Thursday's game, excuse me, which is in the mid 20s. I think he's going to be able to deliver on that again. And I also think he's going to have a larger workload. Because Kenny Pickett with those bruised ribs, I doubt they're going to drop him back to pass as many times as they normally would. So Jalen Warren over. I'm looking for him in the uh, rushing yards market. I like that. I don't mind that. It's a low total. But the bottom line is Steelers just haven't run the football well. They run him like 79 yards per game. So I'd rather go towards Jalen Warren than Najee Harris because he's more explosive. And I think he, he's the better running back out of the two. Yeah, he is. I, he, I agree with that. He's more explosive. I don't think he could survive on his own. You know, again, back to the Zeke 
Pollard comparison, but he does look more productive when he's in there. They're each doing, I think Warren's doing right under four yards a carry. Najee Harris doing 3.7, I believe. So they're both, they they haven't gotten consistently good running games, but I like the 25 and a half, such a low total. And he's going to get eight to 10 carries in this game. Eight to nine carries should get. Um, hey, Tanner, okay. how about that uh, Laporta Lions money line parlay that I told you about, by the way? That was nice. The uh, The Raiders didn't come through for me. Not that I played that, but I was hoping the Raiders came through. I said that. I'm like, I don't like either side. I like the props in this game. You had Laporta. Um, I had Jameer Gibbs. Gibbs had a hell of a day. So Yeah, he, he got, got, Gibbs got the anytime touchdown. He got the over on the rushing yards. He got the over on the receiving yards. He, he's, he's awesome. I'm glad we're finally seeing him in a full-time role. David Montgomery, when he comes back, he better not get the majority of the carries anymore. You know Dan Campbell will. He's going to run him 30 times a game. Well, David Montgomery fits what Dan Campbell wants to do. He's like a physical downhill runner. But Jameer Gibbs is just so much more explosive. And and productive, (laughs) too. I mean, I understand fitting the scheme, but if one guy's producing, then you just got to let it rock. You got to put him in there. Well, I like, I mean, I don't mind David Montgomery getting carries, but it should be at least 50 50. It shouldn't be 75 25 and then bring him in on third down. Cause he's, I mean, he's so, like, he, he was running between the tackles. He was just like squeezing through. And I do think a reason he was ripping the Raiders at the end of the game, that defense was on the field so much in that game. Like there were, there were moments at the end where the holes weren't there, but the Raiders were just gassed. But he had a, he had a huge night. Yeah, he was awesome. And if you guys want to be awesome yourselves, then you know what to do. Smash that subscribe button and press the like button on this video because Tanner and I are going to be back here on Friday giving you our favorite picks for the NFL weekend. But Tanner, you know what to do. Get us on out of here. That was Ride the Line, the greatest podcast in sports betting entertainment. We will see you on Friday for another episode.